For many of us, college is the first place to truly explore who you are. You're away from your parents, living in a new city, figuring out a work-life balance. For a lot of us, it's the first time we learn how to do laundry. It can be a lot at once, but it's such a crucial time for so many people. Now, most of us don't imagine our senior year ending by getting brutally attacked, much less by one of our own teachers. But for Yale student Suzanne Joven, this would be the end of her journey. Suzanne Joven was born in a beautiful medieval village in Germany on January 26th, 1977. That makes her an Aquarius for all my Zodiac peeps out there. She was super bright from a young age and picked up things quickly. She spoke multiple languages and played the piano and the cello. In the fifth grade, she started taking Latin and in the seventh grade, she took French. Okay, we get it, you're brilliant. She was a star student, double majoring in chemistry and biology. She passed all of her exams with flying colors, which I can imagine made her parents happy because they were both cell and molecular biologists. Staying in the family business, I can see. Suzanne took academics seriously and cared about her future. She was super smart and got accepted into Yale, which was her mom's alma mater. College can be the star of a young adult's life. It's where you start deciding what career path you want to take. But when Suzanne got into school, she decided that the science route wasn't really for her. And honestly, props to her for realizing that out quickly. I feel like a lot of times we do certain things to appease people in our lives, like our parents, friends, significant others, yada, yada, yada. But she didn't want to do that. She didn't just want to do something for money. She wanted to love what she was doing. She wanted to help people and make a difference. Clearly money wasn't her main concern in life. And that's where she decided to double major in political science and international studies. Suzanne's friends described her as full of exciting contradictions. She was funny, friendly, active, and people really liked her. She was the one in the friend group who made all the decisions and knew how to have a good time. I'm not gonna lie, I relate a lot to her, minus the being brilliant part. Her friends said that media coverage portrayed Suzanne as this timid, shy person, but that couldn't have been further from the truth. She was opinionated, confident, and brilliant. She was physically and mentally fit, and she could handle herself. So our case began December 4th, 1998. Suzanne was working on her senior essay covering Osama bin Laden. She went to drop off her most recent draft at her senior advisor's office, James Vanderbilt. After this, she headed to an event organized through the group Best Buddies. This was an organization where college students were paired with people from halfway homes, many of them who were intellectually disabled adults. They would host events to create one-on-one -on -one friendships and help find employment opportunities for them. Usually these people were abandoned by their families and didn't have a place where they felt belonged or where they were supported. Suzanne joined this group when she first got to Yale. By this time, she was the head of her local group. She hosted a pizza party at Trinity Lutheran Church for the local Best Buddies chapter, arriving early to set up and leaving late to clean and take down the space. She finished cleaning around 8.30 and offered some friends from the group a ride home. She used a borrowed university vehicle and dropped it off in the Yale parking lot around 8.45. She then began making her way back to her apartment on foot, which was about two blocks away. As she was walking, she ran into a group of friends who wanted her to go to the movies. But Suzanne told them no, she wasn't feeling up for it because she was exhausted from the day and needed to get studying done. Go Suzanne! I admire her self-control. I would have probably been doing keg stands, but that's, that's, that's just me. Anyway, Suzanne arrived at her second floor apartment and sent out an email at 9.02. In the message, she told one of her friends that they could borrow some of her books, but she said she needed to pick them up for the person she lent them to before. Around 9.10, Suzanne logged off her computer and there was no way to know if she contacted anyone else while she was there because Yale phone systems didn't trace calls. She could have been calling the person who had the books, but unfortunately, nobody knows who that person was. Suzanne then realized she forgot to drop off the car keys to the borrowed university vehicle. She hadn't been home very long and was still in the same clothes, but decided it was best to walk to the office to drop off the keys. Along the way, Suzanne ran into her classmate, Peter, which is how we know about the car key situation. He said that she had no other plans for the evening besides homework and sleep. According to Peter, Suzanne seemed totally normal when they were chatting. She acted a little tired, but Nothing at all weird. She didn't have any belongings with her, like her backpack, and in her hand was a small piece of paper. Around 9.25 p.m., Suzanne was spotted walking, but she was taking a roundabout way from her usual route to the apartment. A female student leaving a Yale vs. Princeton hockey game early to hit up an off-campus party said she passed Suzanne on her way. She didn't seem concerned by any of Suzanne's actions, 
everything seemed totally normal. The student remembered seeing a Hispanic or black man wearing a hoodie walking the same way that Suzanne was. And behind, a few paces back, was a white dude with blonde hair wearing glasses. At some point in the next 30 minutes, Suzanne's life would be taken away from her. At 9.55, police dispatchers got a call from a couple who said there was a woman gushing fluid on the side of the road. The location was about 1.7 miles from where that girl saw Suzanne walking. Later on, a piece of the knife would be found within her skull. Her body was found face down, fully clothed, wearing a watch and earrings with a dollar bill in her pocket. Immediately, police thought there was no freaking way that this could have been a robbery gone wrong. Suzanne was pronounced deceased at New Haven Hospital at 10.26. But it's believed that she was already gone about 15 minutes before the police had arrived. She'd been seen walking around 9.25 and 9.55. That's when she was found almost two miles away. There was no way she could have been walking that far, that quickly. She must have been driven or in a car at some point in those 30 minutes. Suzanne's friends insisted that she would have never gotten into a vehicle with someone that she didn't know. So it makes more sense that she got into a car when she realized it was someone she knew. Neighbors said they heard a loud argument around the time of the attack and a light brown van parked right next to where the body was discovered. It was reported that a guy in his late 20s or early 30s wearing a green jacket was running away from the area. And the dude was apparently booking it. And like many cases that we've covered, the police generally had no idea how to handle the evidence. They either lose it or mishandle it and end up pushing back investigations. And this day was no exception to that trend, sadly. At the crime scene, police found a bottle of Fresca. When it was tested for DNA, Suzanne's fingerprints were discovered, along with the palm of an unidentified person. This knowledge wasn't released to the public until after three years after she was executed. This seemed like a small piece of evidence, right? Yeah, you can get some DNA. But it was just a bottle of soda. Come to find out, once that info of Fresca was released three years later, there was only one store in the town that sold Fresca, one block from where Suzanne lived. New Haven police, however, didn't retrieve any security footage or interview anyone from the store, despite public outcry. Blink, blink. Side note, the police are really dumb and secretive in this case, and it is wildly frustrating to me. I understand why some info is kept out of the media. It's sensitive information, and you don't know who's listening. When it comes to things like this, why not release it to the public? Why not give someone the chance to come forward with information? We need to work smarter, not harder, people. It wasn't until 11 years after Suzanne's demise, the DNA from under the fingernails and the Fresca bottle were tested. There was a match to an unidentified person. Sadly, it was connected to one of the lab technicians. The samples had been contaminated. Oh my gosh, it's like nobody knows how to do their job. Just, just give me the goggles and the lab coat and some gloves and a gun and handcuffs. I'll do all the jobs. It's fine. I got it. I can only imagine how frustrating something like that would be for the family. Months went by and no progress was made in the case. Suzanne's parents wrote several letters to the governor of Connecticut and eventually they got a letter back saying that there were thousands of DNA samples backlogged into their system. A group called the Joven Task Force was assembled to give attention to this case. A witness came forward about a white dude with blonde hair running past her the evening of the attack. Police showed her a photo of current professor at Yale, James Vandeveld. She said it wasn't him. Then they brought her into James's office to meet him in person. Which, like, why would you bring somebody into a potential murderer's office? Again, she said that wasn't the guy. And after that, the New Haven police never contacted her again. She met up with a sketch artist to draw up the man she saw that night, but the task force wasn't super interested in this. Instead, they were more concerned about who had the books that Suzanne lent out. So whoever it was, they never came forward. Everyone was stumped and they wanted to put this case to rest and, you know, give the family some peace. They need to put somebody in handcuffs. In these types of situations, the people closest to the victim are immediately questioned. For example, they brought in Suzanne's boyfriend, but ruled him out quickly because he was on a train ride to New York. Also, he took her passing really, really hard, as I imagine any of us would. Then detectives zeroed in on James Vanderbilt, Suzanne's senior essay advisor. They wrote about it in the paper, well, they never outright said his name. They did say Suzanne's senior essay advisor and professor. Not exactly the trickiest code to hack, you know? The police questioned other faculty, students, and people close to James to figure out who he was and how they could put this on him. The main theories were that he was either having an affair with Suzanne or wanted something more and she didn't. And as a result, his classes were canceled. Nobody wanted to sit and take notes from a suspected criminal. In fact, Suzanne's friends mentioned how pissed she was at James for his lack of attention for her essay. 
her parents remembered hearing his name around Thanksgiving break when Suzanne was home. She was annoyed that she wasn't getting enough mentoring. And this is super weird because the sergeant of New Haven police admitted that they didn't have any evidence connecting James to the crime. But they kept hammering into him. I assume the brutality of the attack led them to believe that it was done by someone she knew. She had a blade broken off four inches into her head. That sounds pretty personal. And most of the time, when something is that intense and gruesome, it's known as a crime of passion. When James was interviewed by police the first time, four days after the attack, he took it to mean that he wasn't a person of interest. Then they brought him in for questioning again and accused him of manslaughter. Big jump. He was totally down to give information and didn't even call his lawyer. Come on, my guy. You're a professor at Yale. Don't you know that you shouldn't talk to the cops that a lawyer? They don't want to figure out the problems. They just wanted to pin it on somebody. James offered to take a lie detector test and have his car and apartment searched. Officers did search his car, but never gave him the test or searched his home. It's so frustrating. James was asked to leave Yale because of all of this, but people still wanted answers. So Yale ended up hiring their own private investigators. If you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. And in doing this, the evidence and DNA samples were finally brought to be tested. And guess what? James' DNA didn't match the evidence that they found. Yet, they continued to focus on James and James alone as a suspect. After James was let go from Yale, he needed a new job and was recruited by the US Navy. But the investigators didn't like him and needed to ruin his life. So they called up his new supervisors and tried to get him fired. This guy cannot catch a break. He's gone through years of public scrutiny, suspected of manslaughter with no evidence linking him to the crime. And the cops are trying to take away your job too? So rude. But there's a small plus side to all of this. James wasn't gonna let these people walk all over him. So Yale and the state agreed to a monetary settlement meaning he was gonna get his bag for all the years of BS he had to go through. He was eventually ruled out as a suspect and the New Haven Police Department had to pay him up to $200,000 in damages. Ooh. Sadly, no one has been arrested for this terrible crime and Suzanne's attacker got to walk free, which is honestly heartbreaking. That's where people start to bring up theories because what do you do when you have no viable answers? You try and make them. One theory about who could have done this to Suzanne is a man named Billy. Now Billy isn't his real name, but that's what he's called. Billy was known as the guy who couldn't handle rejection and would just yell at women who turned him down. You know Billy. I know Billy. That all the ladies love that. And Billy's roommates said he was obsessed with the Suzanne Joven case and there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that linked the two. For example, this guy spoke German and went to yell at the same time that Suzanne did and he was known to wear a green jacket. Which if you guys remember, one of the witnesses said that she saw a man in a green jacket running from the scene. Another theory points to an officer behind all of this, because on the first floor of Suzanne's apartment was the police department. And if you remember, they messed up the handling of this case so badly, it kind of makes people think that maybe they have something to do with it. Which we can't rule out people for breaking the law just because it's their job to enforce it. But here's what I think. I think it was a total random senseless killing. Suzanne was a beautiful young woman who was walking alone at night. And when Suzanne took a weird route walking back home, I feel like she noticed that she was being followed and tried to throw him off her path. On top of that, the distance from where she was last seen to where her body was found makes me think that maybe she was running or was forced into a vehicle. How else could she have gotten so far so quickly? But unfortunately, no one knows for sure who really did this. I just hate unsolved cases like this because you just want justice for Suzanne and for everyone that was close to her. But unfortunately, we may never get the closure we're looking for because of so many different factors. And that, my friends, was the case of Suzanne Joven. So what do you guys think? Was it Professor, Billy, or someone else entirely? Tell me what you think in the comments. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this journey. And now that my plant-based lobster rolls are ready, I'm gonna go eat them. <laughs>